Welcome to today's video. Today is a very special presentation. Usually I'm talking about musculoskeletal conditions, orthopedic neurological tests, biomechanics, sports performance, etc. But I'm going to do an interview today with a very special person. This is Evelyn Akai. Evelyn is an immigration lawyer and I've known Evelyn for a while. And we've had some great conversations and I've been in practice for almost 30 years and once in a while I get to meet somebody. It's and it's, it's a real pleasure because I get to pick their brains on different things. And Evelyn is quite remarkable in her profession. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Evelyn here. Keep it short. <laughs> Keep it short. All right. <laughs> we can do that. Anyway, it is an honor to welcome Evelyn to this interview. Her expertise spans the, spans the gauntlet of legal complexities. Her compassion finds expression and extensive community involvement. Evelyn has been involved in numerous boards, Decidedly Jazz, Operation Eyesight, Enterprise for Good, and the International Women's Forum. She does a lot of work in terms of raising funds for low-income women, also underscores her commitment to crucial social issues. Um, she is the recipient of numerous accolades. I didn't know this at first. I go, oh my God, she's so many different awards and different things. But... <laughs> Evelyn's devotion to her profession and community, to say the least, is remarkable. She's a true role model. Now, I've come up with numerous questions here, but before I even get into these questions, Evelyn, I want you to uh, tell me a little about yourself, what your background is, where you know you grew up, mm -hmm. and just about you know for sure community. Happy to. Um, I'm an immigrant, and it's interesting. I'm an immigration lawyer, but I, we moved to Canada in Vancouver when I was five. Okay. So. Um, my family heritage is Ghanaian mm -hmm. and uh, raised in Vancouver, went to UBC Law School and then moved to Toronto and worked for an, on Bay Street for 12 years at Big Law mm -hmm. and then moved to Calgary in 2008 yeah. and then um, started my own law firm, ACA Business Immigration Law in 2010 when right. I had my twins and it was time to adjust the life <laughs> that I have. Yeah. Okay. So you, you've been in Calgary for a while now too. Yes. You've, how long have you been in Calgary? Since 2008. 2008. Yeah. Okay. I love it. Oh, yeah. I, I grew up in Calgary. Mm -hmm. Calgary is quite remarkable. So, first question. As professionals, we have a responsibility to take an active part in our societies. How do you believe immigration law can play a role in creating a more equitable and just society? Wow, that's a big question. It's a huge question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just, I feel like all professions have a responsibility to give back. Okay. And I think immigration is really unique because it's about diversity. It's about bringing different people mm -hmm. into Canada or the United States. And it's about sharing cultures. Yes. So it's just naturally, I think the way that I focus and proceed comes from that place of, of equity because I'm bringing people and recognizing people's international experience, international backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you see that there is an equity when we're not recognizing, for instance, people's professional designations or training or right. language ability. So it comes up in my job quite a bit as we talk about what's fair. That, makes, that makes sense. And I that talk about you need to be prepared. You might have to start all over again. I mean, how many times have you mm. heard of PhDs and medical doctors driving taxis? Like yep. we're just not taking full advantage of their experience and their education. Um, and so that's when I feel like equity plays a part in the work I do on a daily basis. That makes sense. We had a neighbor who was actually from Russia, who in Russia was a neurosurgeon. Oh my goodness. And he was driving a taxi. Yeah. And uh, he was struggling trying to get, you know, mm -hmm. accreditation here until eventually uh, they had to move to the States. And yeah, now he's working in the head of a neurological department wow. as a neurosurgeon. Wow. So something is going through my head is, you know, I don't really understand this process that well, but, you know, why did we lose somebody so exactly. valuable? Exactly. That's a brain drain. And yeah. that is a huge issue. We bring people here, but they don't always get the opportunity to do their best work here. Right. And some of it is, you know, we know you and I, we have colleges, we have organizations that, that regulate and monitor our mm -hmm. profession. Yes. But we need to find ways to open those doors because right. there truly is a need for that. And the efforts of people that I know who have come here mm -hmm. as immigrants with the goals that they have and the dreams that they have, and then they get sometimes shattered because they're not able to 
reach their full potential. Right. And that's a loss for us. Absolutely. And as an immigration lawyer, I am seeing more people not wanting to come to Canada now because they know that the hurdles are major. Where they can go to Australia maybe and it's easier, even the UK. And it might be easier. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting thing because the perception a lot of people have is that it's very easy to get into Canada. Mm. That Canada is very welcoming and the process is quite simple. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you can enlighten me on the reality of this. I think it's simple if you're working with a professional, obviously, and you qualify to get here. Yes. The issue is when you get here, what are you going to do? Okay. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And that's the problem with immigration in Canada because I would love it if they assessed everybody before they got here. Mm -hmm. They went through all of those challenges to know what's going to happen if you're an engineer. What do you have to do to be an engineer in Canada? Mm -hmm. If you're a doctor, a lawyer, what do you have to do? And maybe do a lot of that before they get here. So they're Living, not. They're, they're, not, not. they're, they're, not? they're okay. coming here, starting fresh as immigrants, and having to jump through those hoops, okay. which take years. I had a family doctor from Pakistan, and she had been practicing forever. And she moved here in her mid-40s. She had to go back to medical school. Wow. at U of C and do it all over again. Mm -hmm. So her career was shortened because by the time she finished mm -hmm. all the residency, she would become a family doctor, you know, she maybe had a 10-year career and then she, she, re she retired. Wow. And that was a loss for us. Truly, truly. Okay, next question. In today's globalized world, we're all part of a global community. How do you think social responsibility plays a role in your work and in the field of immigration law as a whole? Hmm. So my practice um, is a little different. I don't do refugee work. And I mm -hmm. consciously made that decision because I was working on Bay Street. There wasn't a lot of refugee work. But mm -hmm. also, I know the emotional toll it can take on the people that I know who do this incredible work. Mm -hmm. So my focus is on skilled workers, families, okay. businesses. Mm -hmm. And I still think there's a lot of um, counseling that I do and a lot of discussions about discrimination mm. and racism because I want them to be very clear that it's not a guarantee that you're going to be approved. So I feel like we all have a social responsibility, even if we're not doing always humanitarian compassionate applications or refugee files, yes. is to be very transparent mm -hmm. and tell them these are your chances. These are the risks. Um, I want you to be fully aware before you spend any money, especially hard-earned money from abroad, to try to come here, that everyone is fully aware of what life's going to be like when you get here. Okay. So I talk to them about housing, cities that are easier maybe for immigrants, for their community, schools for their kids. It becomes a whole um, project as opposed to just let's get you your immigrant work permit or permanent residence. They need to be fully prepared. And I think all organizations have that social responsibility is to make sure they're arming their clients, their friends, you know, a lot of them become friends um, with as much information as possible mm -hmm. so that they're not shocked when they land. And there mm -hmm. have been days I've gone to the airports for some families in the winter because mm -hmm. I know what its shift it is to come from the heat, to come to the cold, to right. start your life. And it's beyond what I normally do, but some organizations don't have that support. Mm -hmm. And you want to help them and you know them after six months, eight months, a year, two years. Right. You know the family. And so right. I feel like we all have to find that balance of where we want to give back in our profession socially and bring the responsibility and ethics and and support. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know if it's immigration is specifically unique, but I think anybody that has a career that mm -hmm. they love wants to think about what they can do. Just like we do pro bono work, we have a number of pro bono files. We did a pro bono day this month for my, for my birthday, and I thought, let's just do it the whole day. We did free consultations. Wow. Because we want to try to make it accessible. Right. It's not always about getting paid. It's about giving good advice as opposed to giving, getting wrong information. It's, it's interesting because what you're saying, too, it sounds like a lot of people don't realize what the expectations are when they get here. The due diligence hasn't been actually completed before mm -hmm. they actually get there. They mm -hmm. have been told certain things, but we actually need to educate them yes. a lot more than they are being. Absolutely. And that's okay. the frustration for me is people come and they've gotten wrong advice or they've done something wrong that mm -hmm. is going to bar them for five years and they didn't even know. Or they uh, okay. didn't work with a lawyer or they worked with an agent or a paralegal and that's not licensed. And sometimes they have made big mistakes right. that we have to clean up. And it is devastating oh. to them to know that, oh, my God, I can't come for five years. We had a woman from Ghana who worked with a, a consultant, 
couldn't read very well, apparently, mm -hmm. and she signed stuff, and in the end, there was a misrepresentation. She did not even know. Wow. And that barred her from sponsoring her husband for five years. So when she came to us, I did the files of pro bono file through family friend, and he's here, he's a citizen now, but I mean, mm. for five years she was married, and they couldn't be together. Wow. So the impact of um, wrong information is significant. It changes lives. I, I think people need to hear that. I think that people need to understand that it's the complexities of this and you actually need to get the right advice at the right time. Mm -hmm. It's like me coming to you. I wouldn't go to somebody who didn't know what they were doing to work on my body from a chiropractic mm -hmm. sports medicine perspective. Mm -hmm. You need to go to the professionals. So I go to professionals. I want people to go to the professionals and not try to figure it out on their own because the risk is high. Pe right. People's futures are at risk when if they make a mistake when it comes to immigration. Oh, that's, that's huge. Um, okay, so... Next, next question here. In light of recent events, such as the refugee crisis and ongoing debates about immigration policies, what do you believe are the most pressing issues facing the field of immigration law? <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> <laughs> it's never boring. I mean, that's probably why I love what I do. I've been doing it for 23 years. It's never boring. Right. It never stays the same. Mm -hmm. Every day is different. Um, right now, I feel like being able to give... Um, immigrants all the information they need from mm -hmm. home as well as the licensing getting them set up for success before they get here that's something that needs to happen and all the different ministers mm -hmm. of immigration I've worked with over the years they all say yes 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 but it doesn't actually get implemented fully so we still have people arriving who think they can just become an engineer or they just do an exam and it's done and they don't realize all the hoops mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. love it if before people came, we as a Canadian you know, um, culture would be able to help them overseas. The right. high commissions there should be helping before they get here. So that when they get here, they know the cost of living. They know housing costs. They know all of that, the tax structure. They have a real sense of where they're going. Um, the other thing with immigration mm. is it's become very automated. Okay. So... When I started immigration, you could pick up the phone and talk to an immigration officer and talk about your file and, and have that chit-chat, that relationship. Right. Mm -hmm. You can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So those special circumstances are not available for you to, to use your influence to advocate for your clients to a live person. Now it's a portal, this, this unknown portal that you upload information to and hope that a real person is behind it because AI has become mm -hmm. a big part of immigration as well. I'm not surprised. And machines are making some decisions, and obviously mistakes happen. But when it's people's lives, it feels like they should be a real person. It surprises me they're not receiving key critical information before they get here, though. That That is surprising. And, you yeah. know, sometimes we watch the media right now, and we take a look at uh, climate change. We mm -hmm. realize, you know, certain areas which are becoming so actually becoming uninhabitable. Yes. And there's going to be massive immigration from different areas. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's really important that we get this right. I agree. You know, I agree. because we're dealing with people's lives here. We're not Absolutely. dealing with just numbers or, you know. That's how I feel. It's yeah. not a number. Of course, you get a file number when you have an immigration file because mm -hmm. there are hundreds of thousands a year. We let many people come to Canada. And I love that Canada is seen as an open place yes. compared to other cultures but or other um, countries. But we're open but we're not always as receptive. Mm -hmm. We say we're open, but we're not always as supportive. Okay. And I think that's the balance that we need to strike. If we are going to allow you to come into our country, we want to help you. We should be helping you to be as successful as possible. We get the benefit of that if they're mm -hmm. successful. Well, I think we get a huge benefit yeah. from immigration. I agree. And I don't think we get arguments in any political party if we're actually doing our screening correctly and mm -hmm. we're looking... In different ways and I think a lot of people no matter where your background is uh, do not realize we're not providing the information that immigrants need mm -hmm. and there's major flaws in our system right now yes and major okay. fraud major fraud so every year they have like a fraud prevention month with immigration they try to highlight you know fraudulent applications I mean mm. but they just had an awful case of students coming to a school thinking they were coming to a legitimate school to find out the school didn't exist. Seriously. And they came from India, 500 students. Oh, my God. So, I mean, there's a lot of fraud because everybody wants to maybe make money from it or take advantage of, which is very sad. Mm -hmm. But people's lives are impacted, and now they're stuck. So it's about finding the right professional mm -hmm. 
definitely doesn't have to be me, but they need to be searching and really digging deep, checking the law societies, checking the immigration consulting regulatory agencies, right. really doing your due diligence, doing a consultation, make sure they mm -hmm. exist, talking to references, you know, checking them online. They have to because fraud is rampant and people's lives and their money are being taken and then they can't actually make the plans that they had for their future. So I think that's a big part of... That's well, huge. Huge. That's huge, huge, huge. So um, can you tell us about any projects or initiatives you are currently involved in that uh, aim to promote social responsibility or social justice in the field of immigration law? Well, there, of course, with law, there is... Um, you know, the Canadian Bar Association, yes. which I've been a member since I've been a lawyer. But recently, the last year and a half, a new organization was started called the Canadian Immigration Lawyers Association, C-I-L-A, CILA. And it was created because many of the founding lawyers, who are people that I look up to, who have mentored me over the mm -hmm. years across the country, we needed something that was allowing us to be more um, focused on advocacy. Okay. Because the CBA is very political and mm -hmm. they do everything right, and, but it takes so long to respond to, to potential new legislation. It takes okay. so long for them to respond to new policies because they've got this political angle and they're also funded as well by lawyers but also supported by the government. Okay. So CELA is truly independent mm -hmm. and we had our first kind of annual get together in Ottawa this summer. It was great mm -hmm. to be able to immediately respond, go up to the house, some of them go up and talk to steering committees and talk mm -hmm. about the impact of perspective changes in the law right then and there. And they can be more, more political. As well, they're focused on helping to reinforce the need for lawyers. Right. Because more and more, you hear about the fraud, you hear about the lack of regulation, and then it negatively impacts our profession. But we're not able to say, hey, we're here. Please look to lawyers. Please work with professionals. So CELA mm -hmm. is really focusing on, on that, as well as talking about AI and the problems with it. Yep. So they're much more direct, which I really like, obviously very professional, but CELA is allowing lawyers to advocate for themselves, whereas we haven't been able to, really. really? Yeah. Okay, and that's surprising. Yeah. And the yeah. immigration bar at the CBA, they are the most engaged bar. We have a national listserv. Every day we're talking to each other, talking about coast to coast to coast mm -hmm. situations, problems, tips. We're so active. We make the, the CBA the most revenue. And so we felt like we should have more <laughs> impact to actually say, why aren't you speaking for us? So we created a new organization. Well, you should, yes, considering that, uh, that yes, you should. <laughs> so how do you see the field of immigration law evolving in the coming years? And what role do you believe social responsibility will play in actually shaping that evolution? Wow, that's a big question, Brian. I only, I'm only asking the small <laughs> They're questions. They're all big questions. Oh my God. <laughs> These are massive questions. They are. I mean, I could talk if all day. If I was to give you this and you asked talk me that, I'd, I'd, I'd be sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like, you know, people get into immigration law. When I hire people, there's a real passion for it. Okay. And I think from that perspective, it can't be looked at as a business. It needs to be looked at as a real passion yes. and a real calling. Right. Okay. Because it's not always easy. You have challenges that come up, come up. You get frustrated by the bureaucracy. It's mm. very, you know, bureaucratic. But at the end of the day, it's about the impact you have on people's lives. So I think if that is the core of the reason why we get up every day okay. is to be able to give back, to understand the impact mm. we're making then I think the quality of the work gets better and better and better that we do because that is driving us. I think it crosses all professions. I agree. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and I think in addition to the work we do, knowing that we contribute to do pro bono, we, we support the arts, we do a lot mm. of pro bono work, whether it's for Calgary Opera, the Philharmonic, Shakespeare Company, DJD, Theatre Calgary. Like we really, See, I told you she's involved in a lot We of love to help <laughs> because we know that these these parts of our community are essential. Right, right. And I love the arts, and I think it's really important. And if they can't afford our services, mm. but yet they want to bring a great talent, a director, a lighting director, somebody to come mm. in, we can do that. And so that's, that's where excellent. we that's put excellent. that's where we put our focus. And in addition to every month, what's our pro bono file? What are we going to do? That it gives mm. us a real sense of satisfaction. Mm -hmm. We love it, and the people that we help are so appreciative. Mm -hmm. And that keeps fueling that desire to do the work we do. So I think every organization, whether you know, I know like for you too, it's about giving back mm -hmm. and finding ways 
to run a business, but to also be a part of the community. Right. You have to be. You have to be. You have to be. Yeah. yeah. And I do a lot of those calls from like Ghanaian people. I mean, my community is the Ghanaian community. They call me. I talk mm -hmm. to them. I give them the straight goods, pros and cons, and then people can make decisions at that point. Um, sometimes there's more pressure when it's your own community, um, you know, because mm -hmm. you want to be successful all the time for them, mm -hmm. and you can't always be. But we do a lot right now. Since I came back from Ghana, my husband and I um, were able to get. Um, a job offer for one of the people that we met who took such good care of us, a Excellent. wonderful young chef who's like driven. He was our, our cook and he has his own catering company. And wow. so we were able to, with my contacts and my clients, mm -hmm. one of my clients owns a number of restaurants and so she's offered him a position. Fantastic. So we're doing the whole thing for bringing him here, It'll probably take eight to 10 months for him to come to Canada and get a labor market impact assessment. And that's all pro bono. So, I mean, that's been really, it's great to be able to help and that's know huge. that we're changing his life and oh, yeah, because is... he took such good care of us, we want to give him those opportunities. Excellent. So, one more question. <laughs> yes, Finally, sir. what advice would you give young professionals who are interested in pursuing a career in immigration law and are passionate about promoting social responsibility and social justice in their work? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think, um, I think it's about being up to date, keep abreast of current events, because mm -hmm. a lot of the things that you and I talk about when I come here are about current events, what's right. happening in the news, what's happening politically. Mm -hmm. It's very important that young people know what's happening in the world. And I find sometimes they can be so focused like this, and they're not mm -hmm. always this broad, because right. I think being broad helps you with your focus, wherever your niche area is. So if it's immigration, I think they need to find the area that that suits their personality. Mm. Some people love the refugee work. Some people love the litigation, going to appeal board events and hearings and litigating. That's not my strength or my passion. Mm -hmm. I think you need to find out what that is so that it can direct your focus in immigration because immigration is so broad. And just like I do cross-border US immigration and Canadian immigration, mm -hmm. um, you've got to find the thing that jazzes you up because you're going to be doing it for a long time. Right. And so being exposed to as much of what's happening in the world politically also shifts what you do. So mm -hmm. when things are happening in the States with, let's say, Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. laying off all these incredibly talented people, immediately it was like, let's change our marketing and let's focus on trying to get them to Canada. Mm -hmm. So by being aware of what's happening, you mm -hmm. can also help more people. That makes so much so, sense. And, and I think great mentorship is very important. As I said, I worked and learned my area mm -hmm. working at Ernst & Young, um, in Toronto at Gowlings, global mobility practices because you need to be mentored by people who've been doing this longer to understand all the nuances. It's not just read a book and you'll be able to fill no, in the totally forms. Agree. It's no, yeah. You need good mentors. You do need yep. good mentors. Yep. And so I always recommend, don't just open your, your door the minute you finish law school mm -hmm. and get articling. Work with people and call on people. I do a lot of calls. I talk to lawyers, young lawyers. I have coffees with law students. Mm -hmm. You know, They reach out through LinkedIn and through my site. And I think it's important that they know that they can create a community of supporters right. and people that will help them when they're in trouble or they have a file that's gone offside. They can call you and tell you the truth and we can work together and fix it. Um, but yeah, that, those are some of the pieces oh, of advice that's huge. I have. So Evelyn, you are a wealth of information. Could you please tell everyone actually how they can get a hold of you? Well, I'm at ACA Business Immigration Law. Yeah. We're headquartered in Calgary. We have Vancouver and Toronto um, remote offices as well. Mm -hmm. And because immigration is national, we can do work across the whole country. Okay. It's federal. And they can reach me at ACALaw.com or at 403-452-9515. Uh, I'd like to thank you so much No, thank for you having so me. much. Oh, it's great to have you here. <laughs> great questions. It's, it's, no, it's a real pleasure to have oh, you Oh, it was here, great having you on mine. And I love that <laughs> we get to talk about all these big picture things that in the day-to-day -day I don't get to think about or talk about as much as I'd like to. So thank you for the opportunity. This is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.